Hey everybody, welcome back to another Foundations in Faith. It looks a little different behind me. I'm recording from my home office, which happens to be an upstairs bedroom, but that's okay. We are back digging into those foundational beliefs, those foundational truths of what it means to be Christian, what it means to be Lutheran, walking through the Book of Concord, big old thing here. Um, today, specifically, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. And we're looking at human traditions, human traditions within the church and what role they play. Are they beneficial? Are they not beneficial? Good questions such as those. And right from the beginning, I want to start by saying, keep in mind that the Apology, at least, was written in the early to mid-1500s by the Lutheran Church, written against the Catholic Church. So if you're following along in the Apology, you're going to hear a lot of things that basically come straight at the Catholic Church and say, you shouldn't be doing this. Um, keep in mind, it's a little bit of a slant. It's a little bit of a, a not, I don't want to say a dig, but it's a little bit of an attack and ex explanation of why the Lutheran Church disagrees with the Catholic Church over these issues. As I say that, there are a lot of things in the Apology that just don't really apply to our context, to our time uh, today. But there are overarching themes that are within that that we can apply to our time and to our examples today. So all that to say, uh, human traditions, more often than not, are classified as adiaphora. That's a word uh, that we use quite a bit within the church, that we use quite a bit within the classes and whatever. This simply refers to those things that are not expressly commanded or forbidden in Scripture. So there's not a clear verse that says, you must meet together at this time every single day and do these things for something to be worshipped. There's no clear statement in Scripture about what, what these things are, no clear teaching about it. So as humans, as people, as we've tried to faithfully practice our Christian faith, we've come up with a bunch of human traditions, a bunch of ways that we do things, that we've traditionally done things, that we continue to do things. Um, we've put those in place. What was happening is that at the time that Luther was uh, rebelling and, and breaking off from the Catholic Church, he was walking through these traditions and saying, okay, what's beneficial? What's not beneficial? Why are they beneficial? Or why should we do away with them? Basically, uh, Luther and Melanchthon and the writers of the Apology, uh, uh, the Augsburg Confession here, we break it into two categories. And they spend a lot of time and a lot of ink and a lot of pages walking through it. But basically, it's two categories. One saying human traditions are good. Here's the reasons why. One saying human traditions are bad. And here are the reasons why. So I'm going to start with the second category first and, and talk about when are human traditions bad when should we do away with them? Basically, this is any time that human traditions obscure the gospel. And they lead us away from Christ and instead lead us to rely on ourselves, on our own works, on anything that we can do for justification, for that forgiveness of sins. Now, these were things, at least in the Catholic Church at that time, these were things like the number of times that you went to Mass, the number of times that you were there when communion was given, the number of times that you went to confession, your ability to confess each and every one of your sins and so be able to receive forgiveness for those sins. A lot of the things we talked about uh, in our last video, these are human traditions that have kind of risen up. Now you can see where they came from. You can see why it's important that we stress we come to church X amount of times in the year. We want people in church. We want them being fed by the word. We want them hearing the gospel proclaimed. You can see why it's good that people go to confession, that they're conscious of their sin, they're made aware of their sin, reflecting on their sin, confessing that, and receiving that forgiveness. Where we run into trouble with these human uh, traditions is when they replace grace, when they replace faith. So it's, it's kind of a fine line, but it's a distinction we have to make in saying the number of times that you go to church does not make you saved. The number of times that you go to confession does not bring about justification. No, what brings about justification, what brings about saving grace, is your faith in Jesus Christ. And that has to be the first and foremost thing in any human traditions that we put into place. It should always point us to the cross. It should always point us to Jesus. And in saying that we are not enough of ourselves, we could never achieve grace ourselves. Jesus has to forgive us. Jesus has to uh, restore that relationship with the Father that he wants us to have and with him. So when these human traditions replace justification or replace forgiveness of sins and turn us back to ourselves, that's when they become problematic. The number of times that you go to confession, again, it does not bring you 
grace. Rather, it's Christ's sacrifice on the cross that brings you grace. So why do we encourage people to go to confession? Because like I said, it's good for them to be reflecting. It's good for them to know their sin and hear again of that grace. But the emphasis is always on Jesus and his work for us, not the works that we can do to earn grace. So to put all that really, really simply and to summarize all that, when human traditions obscure or replace the gospel that we are saved by grace through faith, they are harmful and contrary to scripture. And the, uh, the writers of the apology here say very clearly, humanly instituted traditions for the purpose of meriting grace and making satisfaction for sins are contrary to the gospel. So they're just coming full bore at it and saying, when you replace the gospel with traditions, that's when we need to do away with the traditions and get back to the gospel. So in the sense that traditions replace grace, they are, um, they are not beneficial to the church. They should be done away with. All of that being said, traditions within the church are very, very good things when they're used properly, when they're kept in their rightful place. So when we keep Jesus as Jesus, as Lord, as the only one who can bring us grace and mercy and salvation, and then use these traditions to point to Jesus, that's when they're good and that's when they're beneficial. And quotes from the book, one could approve of traditions, practice, for restraining the flesh, for disciplining the unlettered, or for church order. He goes on to say, the church fathers did not institute a single tradition for the purpose of meriting the forgiveness of sins or righteousness. Rather, they instituted them for the sake of good order in the church and for the sake of tranquility. So traditions are good when they're used correctly and when they're kept in their proper place. We see this all the time today within the Lutheran church, even within St. Paul as we worship together. Things like the church year and the church calendar are very beautiful things for instructing people through the scriptures. As we walk through Advent and the Christmas narrative of Jesus coming to earth, of God reaching into earth and coming to us, joining us because we could never reach him. As we walk through Lent and as we see the suffering and the preparation of Jesus Christ, as we get to Good Friday, as we get to Easter and we celebrate those times and we learn because of the church calendar, because we celebrate these things every year. These are human traditions. There's nothing that says you must celebrate Easter on this day within scripture, but rather that's a human tradition of when we celebrate it for instruction within the church to make that easier. It's good for disciplining yourself, restraining your flesh, restraining your sins. These are things like morning devotions or coming to confession weekly, or even what times we have church services, things of that nature. Ways to keep us, instead of focusing on ourselves, focusing on Jesus, traditions that we've put in place in that way. They're also beneficial for good order in the church, as we've kind of talked about. These are things like the times that we gather, when we have worship services, how often do we have communion? I know in St. Paul we have communion. Uh, when we're meeting together, we have it every single week. Some churches have it every other week. Some churches have it once a month. There's nothing in Scripture that says you must have communion every day, every week, every month, whatever that might be. It says as often as you gather together, as often as you partake of communion, do it in this way. So how often we have communion is a tradition within the church. And churches are free to make the decision on how often that is for the sake of good order in the church. So everybody's on the same page. So everybody knows what's happening within communion, within that celebration, so it can be kept holy in the way that it should be practiced. So the main point is to keep traditions in their proper place, not as something that justifies us before God, but rather something that edifies our faith, builds up our faith, leads us always to Jesus first and foremost. So we talked about a few of these um, traditions, a few of the things that we do within the church, and such as when we gather or how often we practice communion. One that came to light and, and kind of came to uh, a bit of conflict not long ago and still is being debated about um, that I want to talk just very briefly about it. I don't want to go too deeply into it is worship, different types of worship. The type of worship and how you worship together as a church is a human tradition. There's nothing in scripture that says when you worship, you must have an invocation, and then you must have a confession absolution, and then you must have a psalm, and then you must have, there's, there's nothing like that within scripture. So the liturgy that we have, the traditional liturgy, is human tradition. I personally think the liturgy is beautiful. It's steeped in the history all the way back from Luther, even reaching back before Luther. A lot of our 
liturgy is very similar to the Catholic liturgy. It goes way back to the church fathers um, to that time. It's steeped in that history, and it's also steeped in scriptures. As you walk through the liturgy, as you walk through uh, the opening sentences, as you walk through the different things that we do, the scriptures are all over within traditional liturgy. So it is beneficial. The traditional liturgy is beneficial for teaching uh, teaching the scriptures, for memorizing the scriptures, for turning our minds to confession and absolution, for having something to say when we confess our sins, for exposure to scripture, how much scripture is within those um, services, you get to see a lot of it. And it's good for congregational involvement as well, as we see that back and forth, as we see the response of pastor, of people, of saying the Psalms out loud, sometimes chanting the Psalms, things of that nature. Um, so traditional worship is a human tradition, and I think it's a beautiful thing something that we shouldn't get rid of. On the flip side of that, there's contemporary worship. Contemporary worship is beautiful worship. I love contemporary worship. I love the worship we do here at St. Paul and that Keith leads. Um, it's beautiful. It engages a wider range of instruments, a wider range of sounds, a wider range of movement. There's variance week to week in how we, we progress through a service um, that keeps engagement, that keeps in attention. It's a more active service. It's a more energetic service most of the time. None of these, traditional versus contemporary, neither one is better than the other one. Both are great ways to worship. Both, I think, glorify God. Both keep the attention on Jesus. One is not better than the other. The problems arise when people try to say contemporary worship is not true worship or traditional worship is not true worship saying it, it, it's about the way that we worship, the songs that we sing, or the instruments that we play that make worship acceptable to God or something of that nature. It's just not true. I mean, nothing makes an organ better than a guitar. Nothing makes uh, a contemporary worship song better than a traditional hymn, as, so long as they're steeped in Scripture in that way, so long as they're speaking biblical truths in what they say. One is not better than the other. It's simply different ways to worship. And we see this within Scripture as well. We see David worshiping in a different way than we see New Testament Christians worshiping. We see different instruments involved um, from after the Exodus to the time of David to the times when people were gathering together in house churches. So these are human traditions, very different ways of doing worship that I think both glorify God and both are done in a good way and can be done in a good way. They both have their place. But again, they need to keep the emphasis on Jesus. They need to keep the emphasis on his grace, on his salvation that he's won for us on the cross. So when we start saying things like, well, I go to traditional worship, I go to true worship, we're then deflecting, we're taking away from the cross, and we're making the focus on the instruments or the liturgy. We're basically placing justification and saying true worship, where you encounter Jesus, where you hear forgiveness is only in the traditional service, is only in the contemporary service. That's when the human traditions of contemporary, traditional, whatever it might be, they start to take away from the gospel. That's when we, no, we need to start um, exploring. Do we do away with one of these services? Do we not have one of them? Do we need to teach about this differently? What, what's going on? So that's one very real example that's been happening for uh, years now to say human traditions are good in how we practice worship. They can be bad when they detract from the gospel. So this audio offer, the, these things that aren't expressly said or uh, um, commanded or uh, forbidden within Scripture, um, they need to take some time to be thought through, and they need to be kept in their proper place and saying they don't bring salvation, they don't bring forgiveness of sins. That's only through faith, through Jesus and his grace and mercy. And as far as human traditions... We can, we can do some of them. We can do away with some of them. We don't need these things. Um, so as we approach them, as we institute them, as we do away with them, we need to do so with a lot of thought as opposed to just willy-nilly doing whatever we want within, uh, within worship, within our practice of our Christian life. So there you have it, human traditions. There's a lot more conversation to be had around different traditions. If you want to engage in that conversation, I'm more than happy to talk with you about those things. You can always email me. Uh, Pastor Andrew at S-T-P-A-U-L-B-O-C-A dot com. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me. There's also the comment section on this YouTube. Uh, if you comment underneath, I'll be checking in uh, periodically to see what kind of comments there are and, and engage with you in that way. 
Um, but I hope this found you well. I hope you're all staying healthy in this time of coronavirus and getting ready for school to start and all the, the chaos that is in the world right now. I hope you're staying healthy. Uh, I hope you're keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, on faith in him, the salvation he won for us on the cross. And we'll see you next week with another Foundations in Faith.